grade, and his mother and I have basically read everything that he's written. And as you know, novels don't spring up overnight, and from conception to publication has been a number of years. And as the book has come along, we've read the drafts and the revisions and so forth, and we thought, this is really good. But you wonder as a parent, is this, you know, that you're prejudiced or you're not objective in how you're seeing this? And our opinions have been validated. And the book has received amazing press. It has been both amazing and humbling. And for those of you who seen the invitation or bought the book and seen the writings on it, there are all kinds of great blurbs about how good the book is. And I want to talk about that for a minute, probably longer than Taylor wants me to. And I'm not going to go back over any of those that are already on the book. But there's just been a number of other authors, other reviewers, and literary uh, organizations that have said this book is really good. Goodreads, for instance, it, for instance, it's on their short list of novels this month, and they say it's a gorgeous literary achievement. Fans of Cormac McCarthy have finally found an author who lives up to the raw lyrical tradition of his work. Independent booksellers like Mary Jane, people who love and live literature and books, have said through indie books that it's like a blend of Charles Frazier's Cold Mountain and Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Determination, survival, and love all combined to form a thrilling and romantic story set during the final days of the Civil War. Other authors have looked at the book and appreciated it. Wiley Cash, who wrote A Land More Kind Than Home, said, it is a rare thing for a writer to have the talent and scope to exhibit both the best and the worst of humanity in one book, much less one scene. But that's what Brown does here. He literally floods the page with violent beauty and devastating grace. Andrea Williams, the author of The Longest Night, says you'll be completely absorbed in this novel. You'll get downright spoiled and you won't want to leave. You want to keep seeing the fog drift through the gullies and hollers, hearing hoofbeats and the crack of a rifle ominous enough to get your heart pounding, smelling the burning campfires, the gunpowder, the far-off terrifying scorch of Atlanta under Sherman's march to the sea. And there are many more, and I'm not going to go into those, but there's one more I want to read because this is a Southern author, born and bred, writing about the South, writing in that most, one of the most important events in Southern history, the Civil War, Sherman's March to the Sea, which certainly relates here to Georgia. And this is what Southern Living had to say through their daily South. Brown's exacting pace and ability to literally flood the page with imagery, from the tragic to the mundane, places the reader directly into this horrific, yet strangely beautiful post-war raised scene. At times I could feel myself feeling physically cold, smelling the muck of mud, smoke, and manure, yet still pressing on in search of hope, championing the safe haven that Caleb and Ava so badly seek in a world seem lost. It is meant to be read, glass of bourbon in hand, pondered and savored. Reading Fallen Land is an arduous pleasure of the best kind. But y'all didn't come here to hear me speak. You came to hear the author. And so with that, a proud father gives you Taylor Brown. Thank you, Dad. Um, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to thank all of you guys uh, for coming out tonight. Um, people said my hand must be getting tired. I said I'm so grateful. I'll just keep writing until my hand falls off. Um, Seriously, uh, thank you so much. I want to thank St. Williams for having us and uh, Monsignor Kennelly uh, for, um, for hosting us tonight. Um, I want to thank my parents, first of all, Janet and Rick Brown. Uh, becoming a writer is not uh, the easiest of paths, I can tell you that. Uh, it's an often uh, hard, crooked, sometimes rocky path, and there were lots of opportunities over the years where 
lesser parents, I think, could have uh, tried to persuade me to, to turn in the turn in the pen and uh, take a little bit of an easier path. And I just can't thank them enough uh, for always being there for me. I tell you what, it's a lot easier to believe in yourself when you have other people behind you that believe in you too. And um, it's really been in the last few years that I've really come to appreciate that um, as much as I probably always should have. And uh, I just feel so blessed and honored to have Rick and Janet Brown as my parents. So thank you so much. I want to thank, um, there's a lot of my old friends' parents here uh, tonight, and I want to thank all of you guys for coming, who were kind of almost like second parents over the years and providing a lot of love and support, and I just can't uh, thank you guys enough. Um, you know, a writer is not uh, all of his own. He comes from a, you know, is made by a village, I guess they say, and, and St. Simon's is the village that I came from. And I just want to thank all of you guys, you know, that um, were around me growing up, that, uh, you know, helped me stay on the path that I took. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough. I want to thank especially all, all my friends that are here tonight, um, all my good buddies. I want to thank Ben Gallon in uh, particular who is uh, a brother to me. And um, his work, his photographic work, has always served as a big inspiration for me. And um, uh, I'm just really proud of both of us, to be honest. I feel like we have a little voice making it. His next book, Island Passages, uh, which is an illustrated history of Jekyll Island, comes out in June from UGA Press. And so um, I've already seen some of the shots from it, and they are incredible. So um, I encourage all you guys to uh, get out and get that as soon as it's available. Um, so Fall on Land. This story, or this book, actually began, uh, strangely enough, as a short story. Um, and that short story is called In the Season of Blood and Gold, and it's the title story of my short story collection. And that story was actually inspired by a song, an old ballad, called When First Unto This Country. Um, some of you guys might have uh, heard of it. It's one of those old ballads that we don't know much about the provenance. We don't know who originally wrote it. We do know that the first lines, when, uh, which are, When first unto this country, a stranger I came, appear in Irish ballads over 200 years old. It was... Uh, the modern song was first recorded in 1934. It's obviously been around for a long time before that. A lot of the modern greats have covered it. Uh, Jerry Garcia, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, just to name a few. And I have uh, zero musical uh, ability, but that music has always really moved me. And I decided to write a story based on the song. And there's not just the plot of the song in which um, a young boy, probably an Irish immigrant, steals a colonel's horse to go after a girl he loves. Kind of a basic plot. But uh, what I was more moved by was the feeling of the song. And it's just a, an achingly beautiful song. It just has a lonesome sound. It's so sweet and haunting. And I wanted to capture that in my own form in, in writing um, myself. So I wrote this, this story. And... Uh, it ends with a hanging ending, quite literally. And um, uh, I thought that I was done with the story when I was, you know, that I was done with the main character uh, when I was done with that story. But I got to really like this character that I read. You know, this 14, 15 year old kid during the Civil War, Irish immigrant who has uh, fallen in with a band of, of, of real hard men, old marauders. And he's got his overlarge hat and his overlarge coat and his overlarge pistol. And I put him in a real tight spot at the, at the end of that story. You know, but his prospects don't look good. And um, I started to just kind of feel bad about it. I wasn't sure if I wanted his story to um, end that way. And uh, here, I, here I went and put him in this real bad spot and just kind of left him there. So um, a, a hero of mine, Ron Rash, who some of you might know, had once taken a story of his, and um, it ends kind of in a similar fashion where, where the main character's uh, prospects don't look good, and he just kept on writing. And so I sat down on the morning of my 27th birthday in October of 2009, and I just decided I was going to 
write this kid out of the predicament that I put him in and uh, keep going from there. And that's kind of where this book started. Um, and we were living in uh, Asheville at the time, and we moved there about two months before. And it's funny how I think the subconscious works. Because it's really only been in the last couple of months when I've gone back and people have asked me a lot of questions about the genesis of this book and I've uh, really gone back and had to analyze it a little bit that I've realized that the, the narrative arc of the book really actually matches my own life to a great extent over the time that I wrote it. Um, so we moved to Asheville from San Francisco and we thought we wanted to live somewhere close to downtown. You know, we come from a big city, so we, we find this old craftsman bungalow that uh, is for rent. And we talk to the landlady, and she says that this place is an ex whorehouse. <laughs> and so we assume that she means in the old days of, you know, Thomas Wolfe in the 20s or something, but that would be a more common establishment uh, to be around. And I can tell you guys to never assume under such circumstances. <laughs> so this house uh, ended up being the worst house. I mean, it's funny now, but it had mice and ants and uh, mold and drafts and very probably ghosts. Every uh, drug deal in Asheville seemed to happen right off the front porch. <laughs> I saw seven people arrested in the first two weeks. One person um, uh, attacked with a PVC pipe. It's it's. Uh, it was a, it's kind of funny now how bad this place was, but it was not funny at the time <laughs> at all. And uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money or a whole lot of friends at that point. And uh, we decided, you know, we, our kind of goal became after a while to make it, you know, we wanted to make it to Wilmington to the coast. The mountains just hadn't gone that well for us. It was aching, it was achingly beautiful there, but um, uh, the funny thing is that now I look at this book and I see two people trapped in a cold and dangerous world with nothing to rely on but one another and a single remarkable animal, which for us was our uh, rescue gun dog, Waylon. And, you know, I see that there's some big parallels between, uh, you know, our lives and the lives of uh, the characters in this book. So it's just kind of funny how the subconscious works because I had no idea, I never made that connection. And all of the writing it, of it in any of the years uh, after I finished the main drafts or anything like that, it's only really been uh, recently. Um, so I'm going to read to you guys from uh, chapter three. And I'll give you a little background first. We've got uh, two main characters, uh, Callum, who's 14, 15 years old, and he has stolen the colonel's horse to go after uh, this girl. And her, uh, her name is Ava. She's a little bit older, 16, 17. She's pregnant, not by Callum. He's sweet on her. She has not uh, returned uh, that affection. And uh, where we're going to pick it up is their first day on the trail. And they've finally gotten just a brief moment to rest. Callum has dozed off, and um, Ava is standing guard. Um, before I start, can y'all hear me in the back? Everybody can hear me. Pausing to heighten the gravity. <laughs> Callum! His eyes snapped wide. He felt it in the ground. Riders. Up, she said, come on. She had the horse on the edge of the trail. She leapt off with the reins in hand, and he reached out and wrapped hold of the horse's tail. And together they pitched over the ridge and headed nearly straight down, just missing all the trees from twisted from the slope. The horse slid and pitched, scrambling on the loose ground, unhappy at the slant of its world, and Cal followed, his stomach in his throat. Ava, huge quilted, led them, her boots skidding on the wet stones and roots. They went head on into a bed of brambles and stopped. They crouched amid the thorns, hearts crashing in their chests, and tried not to breathe. Riders appeared above them on the trail, riding hard, as if in pursuit or flight. Three of them, black coated, and the last looked hard at the ground as he passed. Nevertheless, they rode on. Callum did not know them, not specifically, but they struck him as something he knew. White men, desperate, their cheeks hollowed, nothing but viciousness to keep them alive. 
He knew some of that. And he knew there was real danger. In